Hello, my name is Jana Rosker, and I'm a professor of Sinology at the Ljubljana University in Slovenia. And I'm very happy to be speaking here again, although still only online, but it is better than other than nothing. So um, I will be today, I will be um, um, introducing some of my views, uh, some of my research results on the topic of the hermeneutics of self and the other. Um, and I will be talking about the concept of self-identity and in, uh, intersubjectivity of these two concepts in Chinese philosophy. So as most of you already know, Chinese philosophy is processual in nature. So in traditional Chinese discourses, human beings are viewed as constantly, constantly changing and dynamically evolving human becomings. It is therefore better to say, to denote us as human becomings than human beings. Uh, so this paradigm has important implications for the concept of individual identity uh, and its self-reflection. So in such a social and ideational setting, identity is not based on essence, for it is contextual and um, it is ceaselessly modified and transformed in its situational context. So in the Chinese tradition, such um, transformative human identity is constituted by the relationship of the human subject to their fellow human beings and by their embeddedness into the social reality in the community and society of which they are, are part. So I would like to emphasize again that um, we cannot say that there is no personal or uh, social or cultural identity. It is only that uh, if we, of course, define identity as a static state, an unchanging uh, state defined by an essence, by a, by the, a substance, um, then of course there is no uh, identity, no personal identity and, and no cultural identity. And if we use these terms in this sense, it is of course um, uh, dangerous and um, incorrect. But um, if we take, if we understand identity as an unceasingly evolving concept and a contextual concept, um, um, continuously modified concepts, then um, it is, of course, still a very important notion <coughs> when we are speaking about uh, self-identification uh, um, or self-understanding of a human being, human becoming. So in this sense, people can only transform themselves. They can only grow and realize their potential if and because they have this dynamic identity. If and because they can always bring it forth anew. So we cannot say there is no identity, actually. So such a transformative um, human identity is constituted by the relationship of the human subject to their fellow human beings and their embeddedness um, and their embeddedness in the social um, reality. Professor Li Zhehao, who has sadly passed away in the beginning of uh, this November, uh, he has called such a um, social system in which um, individual identity is constituted through relationships, relationism, or in Chinese, guan xi zhu yi. On similar ground, Professor Roger Ames and Henry Roseman have pointed to the normative nature of this social position 
positions and coined the term Confucian role ethics because we are living different roles in this uh, system. We are not playing them, we are living them. So um, in this lecture, I will address the question of how um, the human self based on such a relational and dynamically changing identity refers to other people or other human selves. In other words, I will talk about the concept of relational and transformative intersubjectivity in the Chinese tradition. So in doing so, I will proceed from um, some general remarks on the Chinese hermeneutics uh, or issues related to the specific methods of interpreting classical Chinese texts, because if we find a good method to interpret this text, we will um, find it much easier to understand the notion of the human self and its uh, and uh, their relationship to other fellow human beings. Um, so the so-called intersubjectivity. Um, yeah. So um, we will proceed from the notion of hermeneutic, um, understood as a study or methodology of text interpretations and as a theory of the principles of the transfer of meanings, respectively, Chinese hermeneutics has a rich and very specific tradition, which can be traced back to Wang Bi and Guo Xiang from the third century, um, namely from the Wei Jin Nanbei Chao period, which um, came after the Han Dynasty. So, a most important figure who left um, very important traces in the history of Chinese interpretative theory was Liu Xiang. Uh, sorry, Liu Xie, who lived in the fifth and in the sixth century, and he um, came into uh, he became a really influential historical fi figure in the Chinese literary world as the author of the famous work, Literary Mind and the Carving of Dragons, Wen Xin Diaolong in Chinese. So Chinese hermeneutics mainly describes various methods of interpreting Chinese thought, mostly through comments and explanatory connotations, annotations, sorry, rather than problematizing uh, questions regarding why we interpret something in such different ways. According um, to many scholars, a metaphysical discussion is not the subject, the subject matter of a Chinese, typical or specific Chinese hermeneutics. But now let us take a closer look upon um, hermeneutic methods uh, as applied in and described in contemporary China. Very soon it becomes clear, it becomes clear that in this field we can encounter similar problems as the ones pertaining to the much more general question of the very existence of Chinese philosophy as such. So Professor Ang also um, uh, exposes uh, the following. He wrote, if all acts of reading, interpreting, and understanding are seen through the Western hermeneutic lenses, based on the premise that Western hermeneutics is the only legitimate conceptual and philosophical tool, can an accurate image of the Chinese exegetical efforts ever be captured? When Western hermeneutics is taken as the normative and prescriptive manner of reading, cultural particularities are swamped and flattened out for the spurious case of analytical unanimity and coherence. And such in its essential is the sin of cultural hegemony to employ a much used neologism. So, but on the other hand, some 
also mostly uh, mostly Western um, scholars uh, express their doubts in the opposite uh, direction, namely doubts regarding the question whether the Chinese tradition of interpreting the classics is truly comparable with the European um, hermeneutic method, and hence whether it is suitable to call it hermeneutic at all. For instance, um, Wolfgang Kubin uh, has repeatedly questioned uh, this uh, traditional interpretative methods of Chinese philosophy and literary theory. And he uh, expressed many doubts regarding the question of whether this is a, a hermeneutical method or not. Here we have once again landed on the marshy ground um, on which we have to build the entire concept of Chinese philosophy. It is completely clear that Chinese ideational and intellectual tradition did not categorize its thought in accordance with strictly separated disciplines, like um, which, which means that we cannot find in this tradition systematic ideational branches of epistemology, logic, phenomenology, or precisely hermeneutics. But this, of course, does not mean, this does not imply that it does not include a magnificent amount of prosperous and opulent epistemological, logical, phenomenological, and hermeneutic uh, systems or text. Once again, we cannot but emphasize that one of the largest differences in uh, dividing Chinese and Euro-American um, thought or traditions of thought might be found in their respective classifications, which are tightly, of course, connected to the entire categorical apparatus and the entire uh, structure of methodology in uh, Western countries or in China, respectively. Uh, Gu Mingdong also points out, uh, a contemporary scholar, Gu Mingdong, um, also points out that although traditional China did not lack conceptual inquiries into reading and writing, its hermeneutic perceptions were scattered in various kinds of discourses and have never been synthesized into a clearly defined system. On the other hand, however, he also argues that the Chinese tradition has formed an implicit system of reading and writing with fascinating insights that not only predated similar ideas in the West by centuries, but also anticipated contemporary ideas of hermeneutics openness and open poetic. On this basis, Gu Mingdong has created a modern interpretative instrument based upon the concept of hermeneutic openness that provides that proves itself as a very, very useful tool, um, not only in Chinese, but also in intercultural research or even in the hermeneutics of some Western texts. So here in this context, we also have to mention uh, Chong Chong Ying's innovative theory of anti-hermeneutics according to which the Chinese interpretative um, paradigms are always rooted in a specific understanding of reality. In such a view, understanding is inseparately well, uh, connected to being. This paradigm is tightly connected to another specific, specific or special feature of uh, Chinese philosophy or Chinese hermeneutics, namely in its surpassing of the subject-object division and its deep embeddedment into intersubjective understanding. Notwithstanding many problems and difficulties with which all scholars dealing with Chinese hermeneutics 
are necessarily confronted, one can certainly sense a quite optimistic spirit among them. And if there can be socialism with Chinese characteristics, why not her uh, hermeneutics with uh, Chinese uh, characteristics? So, um, Notwithstanding the aforementioned uh, kernels and promising seeds of um, different interpretative models, most scholars investigating classical Chinese thought uh, or classical Chinese texts, sorry, uh, still apply interpretative mechanisms derived by um, Western hermeneutic theories. In the first three decades of the um, after the establishment of the PR China, Chinese intellect, uh, intellectuals were in this respect mostly dealing with the studies of Hegelian and Marxist theories. But from the 80s of the previous century on, um, they have yet again gained access to most of the classical words of uh, modern Euro-American Euro hermeneutics, including Schleiermacher, Dilthe, Heidegger, and Gadamer. And Gadamer's theory of the fusion of horizons soon gained a widespread popularity among Chinese theoreticians. Really, they were really in a wave all falling for Gadamer. Uh, so Lauren Pfister wrote about that overall, it has been the influence of Gadamer that has seemed to dominate, even though more informed discussions of a relatively wider range of European hermeneutics uh, philosophical works were already manifest in publications available during the early years of the 21st uh, century. So Gadamer was uh, indeed very influential in contemporary China uh, during the last decades, and he still remains to be very influential. So as is well known, uh, Gadamer's concept of the fusion of horizons was based on an elaborated version of Schleiermacher's notion of the hermeneutic circle, namely on the idea that one's understanding of a text as a whole is established by reference to the individual parts and vice versa. Uh, the understanding of each individual part is being established by reference to the whole. Neither the whole text nor any individual um, part of the text can be understood without reference to one another, which can be illustrated by a circular model of comprehension. So according to this view, the fusion of horizons takes place between the writer and the readers, the speakers and the listeners, the artists and the observers, in the dialectical process of transferring meanings. So in this sense, um, the concept of horizon refers uh, to the particular situation into which every individual mind is embedded. Whereas the situation is not limited to the vision or perception of what is nearby. Hence the horizon implies the openness of existence and the possibility to overcome one's own prejudices, although they are by Gadamer seen in a quite a positive way as a some kind of uh, pre-structures in the Heideggerian sense that can um, that that constitute the necessary condition of the possibility to understand anything. But anyway, these prejudices have to be put as Husserl would say would say in brackets, and, um, and we should surpass them um, in order to create new meanings. Yeah. For in this dialectical process, which, which, which takes place between the um, author and the reader or observer or audience, um, this dialectical process is a process of mediating and perceiving. It is a process of 
transferring meaning. So it incorporates in Gadamer's view both horizons of the author and of the reader and surpasses on the other hand, on, on the, uh, on the other hand their individual uh, limitations. However, while in China, the theories of the Gadamerian discourse, including his uh, predecessors and uh, successors, might represent a precious contribution for a successive uh, establishment of transcultural hermeneutics. Uh, this overall uh, enthusiasm should also be um, gently put on the brakes by raising some questions on the nature of this circle and this horizon, because it is not without problems. So, of course, the circular character of understanding does not make it impossible to interpret the text. Rather, it stresses that the meaning of a text must be found within its context. But the problem is precisely that the very concept of the context has never been sufficiently explained and defined, particularly in view of different layers of reality and different modes of their perception and categorization. In my view, the very term of contextualization and its respective contents can, for instance, at least be divided into external and internal contextualization. So internal uh, contextualization refers to the cultural, historical, and um, political, literary context, and it even includes the, some characteristic features of the person of the author. Um, but the letter refers the, um, Internal contextualization refers uh, rather to the inherent conceptual dimensions um, of a certain uh, text and their semantic and philosophical implications and development. So the meaning and the involvement of meanings of um, um, certain notions and ideas that can be, uh, that form a part of the text. So the hermeneutical method is still lacking a binding inherent consistency. So at least sinological scholarship has not yet succeeded in developing a method that combines these two kinds of contextualization and the situation in Chinese language scholarship is not much different in this respect either. On the one hand, scholars in Sinophon countries have developed brilliant theories which help us understand the historical significance of the time and space of politically, ideologically, and culturally conditioned factors um, upon the interpretation of any important classical text. Such theories of external contextualization are mainly written in the area of intellectual history. So, for instance, the Taiwanese um, scholar Huang Junjie, a contemporary Taiwanese scholar, um, he, for instance, has written several significant words in this field that have clarified important elements of the historical development of the excesses of Mencius. He has also illuminated how and why certain classical works of Chinese tradition have been, for various cultural, political, and ideological reasons, decontextualized and recontextualized in the course of their incorporation by Korean and Japanese culture when Confucianism was transferred um, to and, and, and also assumed by Koreans and uh, later um, Japanese intellectual circles. Um, but on the other hand, let us briefly return in this context to uh, Cheng Zhongying and his aforementioned method of um, anti-hermeneutics, so Banti Quan Quan Shi Xuan. 
uh, that was rooted in the Dumerian hermeneutics, but further explored and developed in terms of the Confucian worldviews. Chang believes that the traditional Chinese hermeneutics is ontological. His model is rooted in the presumption according to which the understanding of reality and truth is simultaneously the source of meaning and the driving force for seeking understanding. And the understanding, as I already said, cannot be in this context um, uh, distinguished or divided from the being or from the becoming from the existence as such. So according to Chang, no understanding or interpretation can be made without such, uh, um, such a reference. So he is uh, speaking here about truth and the reality and how we perceive the truth in the reality. But irrespectively of the questionable nature, nature uh, in my view, of the notion of truth in the Chinese worldview, the ontohermeneutics is in general doubtless an interesting and innovative um, approach for the investigation um, of the traditional Chinese mode of exegesis. Um, exegesis. However, the problem is that uh, we have to discuss whether in this context, um, what is in this context the main question of different contextualities underlying all these theoretical approaches? Uh, if we look at Huang and Chang, respectively, they were both applying hermeneutics, but they applied it in a very, very different way and also on very different grounds. Um, the two kinds of hermeneutics they have applied uh, or they respectively propose obviously refer to two very different things. As we have shown, uh, as I have shown elsewhere, namely in my recent book on the methodology of Chinese uh, philosophy, uh, which is called Interpreting Chinese uh, philosophy and new methodology. Um, the first one, Huang Junjie's hermeneutical method is based on the external and Chang, uh, Chung Ying's method is rooted in the internal contextualization. So uh, we must know that we are speaking here of two different kinds of hermeneutic approaches. The former refers, as I already mentioned, to the cultural, historical, literary, political um, context of the text, and the latter to the inherent conceptual dimensions and their semantic and philosophical implications and development. So the hermeneutical method is still lacking a binding inherent consistency, not only regarding its various um, particular methods, but also regarding the multifarious differenti uh, differentiations or distinguishing, uh, distinguishes this thing. Yeah, differentiations is better. <laughs> uh, that can be detected within and between traditional explanations of uh, its crucial methodology uh, or terminology, sorry. So um, this is, but this, the most tragic thing is that this is not the, uh, this is by no means the only problem linked to the method um, of uh, hermeneutics, especially Gadamerian hermeneutics. In my view, what is even more questionable it, it's pre, it, is its premise, which presupposes the existence of a normative intelligible meaning. Proceeding from a positive re-evaluation of the function of prejudice in the sense of Heideggerian uh, anticipatory structures, Gadamer highlights that understanding always involves what he terms the anticipation of completeness. In other words, it always involves the verifiable assumption that what is to be understood 
constitute something that is understandable, that is there and it is understandable. That is something that is constituted as a coherent and therefore meaningful whole. In Gadamer's own world, words, the concept of horizon and the fusion of uh, horizon respectively uh, could represent a means to grasp the own meaning of the text. So Gadamer writes, we are always affected in hope and fear by what is nearest to us. And hence we approach the testimony of the past under its influence. Thus, it is constantly necessary to guard against over hastily assimilating the past to our own expectations of meaning. Only then can we listen to tradition in a way that permits it to make its own meaning here. So, in his view, there is still an objective, exist, objectively existing um, conceptual meaning. Uh, being there somewhere and waiting for us to be discovered. And I think this is problematic. And I'm not the only um, person who thinks this is problematic. But the whole uh, post structuralist uh, school of philosophy in Europe um, is thinks that obviously this is still a conceptual view of hermeneutic understanding, and therefore it is um, problematic. Because um, as we have seen, um, it presupposes an own meaning of a certain tradition or discourse. The problematic nature of such supposition can be delimited, but by Derrida's famous statement that there is uh, nothing um, outside the text which was always uh, understood or misunderstood as uh, there is nothing outside the words. But he, uh, what he meant with this text is actually context. It is a much wider, wider notion. So, um, he emphasized that what he really meant by there is no outside text is that there is no outside of context. So in his view, the meaning is always contextual. And um, this contextual um, nature or the contextual understanding of a meaning has prevailed in several contemporary Western discourses, including the psychoanalytical philosophy. Uh, on such a level, the very idea of the hermeneutical circle also becomes problematic. Because um, it is not surprising that Lacan also highlighted that such a circle is without semantic support. Since the meaning is a product of an infinite sliding of the referential surface, surface. On this basis, Zizek rejects the hermeneutical circle, which implies the anteriority of the entirety of the semantic horizons in particular statements. In his view, hermeneutics proceeds to the edge of interpretation. <laughs> But just before reaching it, it covers its eyes for the realization of the fact that there is no original meaning which could provide a basis for a different referential network for the transmission of the reference because the meaning is always relational. And I do agree with this um, presumption. So this critique of a static uh, conception of meaning can also be connected uh, back to Jacques Derrida, to his critique uh, of the metaphysics of presence. Uh, Derrida approached this discourse for its systematic tendency to prefer or privilege uh, notions such as identity, unity, and entirety over marginality, otherness, and difference. Particularly damaging has been in his view the tendency to conceive uh, of linguistic truth is the presence of what is expressed by its in representation of words. Indeed, the ungrounded nature of meaning, the fact that meanings are not given by a direct relationship with things in the world, in the world but only by their mutual structural connections, 
confirms that what is expressed is never fully present, but is instead infinitely mediated by an endless chain of meanings. The concept of truth as presence is therefore not viable. In Derrida's theory, the two concepts, uh, concepts difference and um, dissemination, characterize the infinite nature of meaning and the futility of metaphysics attempts to reach a point of finality or closure. So in difference, of course, is, uh, is Derrida's uh, own neologism um, that implies both a special different and a temporal, uh, a spe special um, space difference and also a temporal um, deferral. So um, what is important to know here is that meaning are not constituted by a direct relation with things in the world. There is not a direct one dimensional, dimensional linear um, connection between um, objects of the world and their meanings. It is uh, what, what counts here or how we could uh, understand uh, or perceive a meaning uh, is only through their structural connections, to, through structural connections between the objects. So, as you could see, I do agree that meaning is always relational. So, Gadamer's model of uh, hermeneutical circle, which is based upon a conceptual view of horizons, is indeed problematic. However, instead of uh, lamenting over this fact, we should rather search for an unconceptual foundation of the um, semantic unification. Um, in the process of interpretation, so in my view, Gadamer's paradigm of horizons, which is, as we have seen, still conceptual in essence and therefore problematic should be replaced through an unconceptual paradigm because the, uh, the paradigm of fusion of uh, these two realms, uh, which he calls horizons of author and observer is still a very precious uh, paradigm, but it should be replaced through an unconceptual paradigm such as for instance, Jingjie in Chinese, um, from the Chinese philosophy, uh, Jingjie could be translated, um, is being translated as sphere, atmosphere, aesthetic realm. Um, it has a Buddhist origin and belongs to crucial notions in traditional Chinese metaphysical and literary writings. So horizons should be in this sense um, replaced by Jingjie's. But what is actually Jingjie? The most common translation is aesthetic realm. And of course, um, this important and typically Chinese aesthetic notion is a hermeneutical tool that can help us understand artistic and intellectual creations through the lens of the various manifestations of the human living world. Um, so Jingjie is an uh, aesthetic uh, realm, but of course we cannot understand here aesthetic as a kind of cosmetic or neither as only um, academic discipline uh, which um, investigates the beauty, the concept of beauty or also ugliness, but rather in a deeper and wider sense philosophically, namely as a uh, philosophical discipline which explores our judgments, why we evaluate something that we perceive as good or bad, or beautiful, ugly, uh, and so on. So um, the Jingji sphere can only be experienced, but it cannot be fully described in concrete language nor can it be reflected upon in purely conceptual thought. So uh, Jingjie, as the uh, 
as um, in this sense as the aesthetic realm is an uh, union of external and internal or unification of external and internal elements which takes place on the level of the transformation of external formations on the one hand and uh, and images on the one hand into a specific spiritual or mental realm so if we just uh, look at this um, notion um, historically in the beginning um, in chinese jingjie was a term pertaining to geopolitical discourses so it, it, it expressed a, a certain realm uh, that was limited by boundaries uh, it was used for mapping out the geopolitical world of ancient china it evolved into a philosophic religious discourse of a mental or psychological territoriality after it was employed to communicate the buddhist ideas of spiritual reality and enlightenment in the sense of crossing to the other shore in other words the notion of aesthetic realm primarily pertained to the objective features of external reality the internalization of the psychologically transmitted formations of this basic level of jingjie of this historical um, meaning of jingjie is um, linked then to the later buddhist interpretation of its nature the unification of in external and internal elements take place on the level of transforming this outward these external formations and images into a specific uh, mental realm so um and it was of course then also uh, upgraded and developed further during the neo confucian discourses of the ming and uh, sung and ming dynasties but uh, for our hermeneutical uh, issue here um it is important what happened to it in the pre-modern um era um namely the notion of jingjie became central to wang guowei's aesthetics because we know wang guowei was the father of the modern chinese aesthetic and he defined the concept um of jingjie as follows he said the realm does not only refer to landscape or scene the emotions of joy and sorrow and anger and pleasure also constitute a sort of aesthetic realm in the human heart or in the human heart mind uh, so in chinese jing fei du wei jing wu ye xi nu ai le yi ren xin zhong zhi yi Jingjie, very beautiful. So in this way, Jingjie is a paradigm that appears within an aesthetic noumenon in order to manifest a certain significance or insignificance of human life, and to convey a certain meaning in a different, in a more direct, in a more intuitive um, way. So what Wang is referring to in that. Quotation we have just uh, read is the objectification of psychological state in which the external realm is fused with the inner world through uh, subjective sensuality. And uh, what do, what do we mean by the external realm? It is not only the landscape. It can refer to both or, or what we see or perceive from the external uh, world. Uh, it can refer to both an objective state in present or past external reality in which the subject is embedded but also it can refer to a subjective reflection of um, this um, outside uh, world or even of things that are imagined in our mind uh, so in this way um it appears as an aesthetic noumenon. It has a kind of a transcendent dimension. And the manifestation of meaning it conveys is therefore rooted in the experience of 
the transcendence of uh, noumenal, of something that surpasses the limited um, the limitations of our um, body or our sense uh, organ organs. So um, it is a notion that pertains to the margin of the immanent and transcendent sections of time and space within the present moment of here and now. So in spite of the fact that Wang's theoretical framework was clearly strongly influenced by Western philosophy, especially by Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, it can still be defined as the revelation of life through the relationship between feeling and scene and the objectified realm of the artistic subject. However, this aesthetic realm cannot be reduced to mere integration of feeling and scene, nor to the emotion, sensibility, or motivation of its authors or creators. It also implies dissolving the differences between self and the others. And it transcends the utilitarian purposiveness without having to negate the will, desire, and life itself. Therefore, it could also serve as a tool for creating subtle blends between traditional Chinese hermeneutics on the one side, um, and the Western philosophies of hermeneutics on the other. So it, Jingjie is a very useful uh, idea in this, uh, in this sense, a very useful uh, tool, because it can dissolve the difference between the self and the other, as we, can, we will see later on the uh, examples I will bring. Uh, it transcends all utilitarian purposiveness, but without eliminating will, desire, identity, and life itself, which is actually a thing that is really difficult to achieve when we follow the um, hermeneutic approaches of the uh, so-called Western philosophy. So um, the aesthetic realm, sorry, the aesthetic realm conveys meanings with diffusive, continuously dispersing edges, which cannot be compared to the meanings confined into the narrow semantic spaces with fixed borders of conceptual definition. So Wang Wei also wrote, Gu neng xie zhen jing bu, zhen gan qing zhe, wei zhe you jing jie. So he defined Jingjie, the aesthetic realm, in the following way. Hence, if a text captures in word, words a real scene or a real emotion, it can be said to convey an aesthetic realm. So this is not only true for poetry, painting, uh, or other works of art, because Jingjie possesses as we have seen, a transcendent, a noumenal dimension. It can also be discovered in numerous, but certainly not all, uh, philosophical works. They also um, contain insights which convey a philosophical idea, not only through conceptual phrases, but rather through that which is engraved between the lines, creating a certain atmosphere consisting of images, associations, sensations and emotions experienced and expressed by their author on the one and perceived and re-experienced by the readers, by the audience. So Lidze Hall um, for instance has precisely through the realm of inner experience uh, linked philosophy to literature or poetry, and he doesn't stand uh, completely alone with that. We all know that, uh, especially in the field of continental philosophy, in Western philosophy, um, many works uh, also uh, possess uh, dimensions which 
don't uh, do not only have a very um, philosophical um, very um, value a great philosophical value, but also a great literary value. So Lietzehau has defined uh, philosophy as science imbued with poetry. A science, he said, it offers us a systematic way of exploring and comprehending reality. As poetry, it walks with us through the opaque jungle of our life on a long and intimate journey uh, that not only offers us beauty and pleasure, but also forces us to confront fear and melancholy. Philosophy can be a way of life that is rational and artistic at the same time. It not only urges us to search for an answers to eternal questions of being, but also unceasingly raise new, one, new ones. It does not remain limited to discovering the world, but also allows for its ongoing creative change. Jinjia, or aesthetic realm, might be one of the most typical hermeneutic paraphernalia of philosophy that was created in China. Because it seems that uh, precisely here, this affinity and subtle closeness between the philosophical depths of rationality and sensitivity come to life and find, find their untroubled home, even when it comes to fundamental existential concerns. So Jingjie, I would also like to point out to a certain extent or in certain aspects, Jingjie, the aesthetic realm, can also be compared to Heidegger's understanding of Stimmungs, moods or attunements, which for him revealed the, be the being of Dasein. For according to him, Dasein always, uh, is always in an attunement. The world is discovered in a mood, in a Stimmung, always. It is a very basis on which we can establish or being in the world. In other word, words, moods establish how we feel ourselves in the world. Similar to Heidegger's moods, aesthetic realms or jingjes represent a pre-subjective and pre-objective sense of being in the world. So, um, it is completely clear that Jingjie is not a conceptual paradigm, but one that can at the most be grasped through situational and contextual approaches. Hence, like Chinese language and Chinese philosophy, interpretations through aesthetic realms are always linked to context as much as to concrete experiences. I will try to illustrate such a holistic contextual uh, interpretation by an example of two essays from Zhuangzi. For this purpose, let us first take a closer look to Zhuangzi's famous essay about the seabird. So I think most of you probably know it, but for those of you who don't, I will shortly explain what is it about. Now, once upon a time, on the outskirts of the land of Lu, a bird of paradise appeared. The emperor of Lu received it with great honors and expressed the welcome to it. And he had it transferred to the highest temple and uh, treated it to the best wines and offered it the most enchanting music to please it. He slaughtered the best sheep and cattle and gave it a rich banquet, a pure banquet. But the bird was depressed not taking a bite to eat, nor a sip to drink. And um, after three days, it just died, as simple as that. This is what happens if one uh, feeds birds with um, food for humans instead of food uh, for birds. Those who know birds should receive food suitable for them. 
would have let the bird fly into deep woods. It, they would um, let her to rest on the tree, on the trees. They would have let it fly above ground and soar above rivers. They would have let it hunt for its own food and feast on the small fish that it likes. It would have followed its flock, its flock and stopped and rested whatever it pleased. It would have freedom. Birds are most bothered by human voices. If we would play the greatest symphonies of the greatest musicians in the deep woods, all the birds would fly away and all the animals would would flee and all the fishes would swim to the deepest uh, levels of muds uh, of waters. So, and fish can only survive in water, but human beings, we uh, die in water. So we have to see that uh, we are different, that we live in different worlds, that each of us has different needs and different um, fears and different uh, desires. So, and if this uh, King of Lu would understood that, if he could, he could in some sense dwell uh, himself into the Jingjie, into the aesthetic realm of this, this bird, uh, the situation would end in a less destructive way, that's for sure. So, we must be aware of the fact that we are parts of different worlds, living in different realities, and we have to respect this diversity that defines us as human beings or human becomings. So that it, which, is, which is not a bird cannot simply judge on its own and conclude that what is best for them is best for birds. This is a Taoist critique of the golden rule advocated by the Confucians, which finds its most famous expression in the advice not to impose on others what you would not wish done to yourself. We must be aware of the fact that we are parts of different worlds and again that we uh, live in different realities and therefore uh, the world is diverse and that is good actually. So, <clears throat> but of course, this is one story of John. But as Fabian Heubel also um, points out in his recent book on what is Chinese philosophy, Zhuangzi was quite deliberately not interested in the systematic uniformity of his philosophy. So we cannot just take this message and project it to the uh, Zhuangzi's work as the whole. Uh, also, François Billetier also says that uh, an overly coherent discourse would have seemed suspicious to him, for he was primarily interested in the aporias of thought, the paradoxes and discontinuities that we encounter in the course of our experience of self and the world. So he was not disinterested in a coherent discourse. He still wanted a coherent discourse, but not in this logically systematic way. Like, because I'm not a bird, I cannot inherently know the likes and dislikes of Birds. This is what this story says, but um, we cannot project this message to uh, to the Zhuangzi as a whole, as a whole book, because it is merely an assumption of Zhuangzi's method of perception and communication. It is not by any stretch a system of logical systematization. Such pre preferences are typical of his friend Huisha. Um, and um, yeah, who always wants to systematize his Zhuangzi's uh, uh, certain quotations or his um, his opinions in certain situation, and he wants to generalize it. 
Like for instance, um, we could say because um, if we could uh, if we could uh, tr if we would uh, uh, translate this uh, main message of the bird to of the seabird of the story of the uh, seabird to um, to um, uh, the form of a um, three-parted inference, it would look like that. It could look like that. The first premise says humans cannot know birds. Then the second premise says Zhuangzi is human. So the conclusion is Zhuangzi cannot know birds. So if human be beings cannot know birds because they are not birds, should it not also be true that they cannot know fish because they are not fish? So the second inference should also apply. The first premise says humans cannot know fish. The second one says Zhuangzi is human, so the conclusion is Zhuangzi cannot know fish. So these two inferences have, the, have a completely um, identical form and they both are valid in the terms of uh, the tenets of the uh, formal logic. But uh, Zhuangzi uh, is not uh, so, uh, he is not so uh sure that um this is all that simple so let us first listen to another story of him from the autumn water section section in john's external chapters and this is the famous uh lovely story about the happy fish which also i believe most of you know but uh for those who doesn't i will uh i will shortly I will shortly um, um, translate it. Uh, so Zhuangzi and Huishi are uh, strolling over the bridge, um, over the Hao River, and Zhuangzi says, well, the white fishes are swimming uh, to and fro, and this is uh, so vividly, so this is the, this is the um, joy of the fish. Uh, but then Huisha says, but you are not fish. So how can you know what is the joy of fish? Um, Zhuangzi then says, but you are not me. So how can you know that I do not know what is the joy of fish? And Huisha says, I am not you. Therefore, I cannot understand you. But you are also not a fish. And therefore, you cannot understand fish. That is all. And then John says, well, then let's go back to the beginning. You asked me, where can you know what is the joy of the fish? So at the time you asked me, you must have known that I know, and you still asked me. So I'm going to answer, I know that um, over the, uh, um, on the bridge over the Hau River. So hmm. was John here playing with sophisms? Uh, he was obviously playing with words because the Chinese interrogative an, which we can see here on this um, on this um, slide, um, can refer to time, space, or manner. It can just mean what, how, when, or where. And if we translate, who is just questions by translating this un in the late in the latter manner, Zhuangzi has provided a completely correct answer. So if we translate the sentence under Yujula uh, with where do you know what is the joy of fish, then of course Zhuangzi's reply was uh, completely uh, correct. But um, if we take into account the context of traditional China at the time when in which he lived, Zhuangzi, or, or in when this work was or is supposed to have been created, uh, we will readily think that Zhuangzi truly wanted to say something more meaningful with this anecdote and to impart a real mean message. So, uh, but of course, this. Um, but of course, this uh, following story is 
I mean, can be interpreted in many different ways, especially the, the, the story of the happy fish. Um, it, it, it has countless different interpretations and throughout the history there have been really uh, a real flute of different interpretation of this charming story. So the most recent one can be enjoyed in the collection uh, Drunks and the Happy Fish, uh, edited by Ro Roger Ames and Takahiro Nakajima, and it includes many, many different interpretations from the analytical one to hermeneutics one to metaphysical ones and um, very, very uh, different indeed. Uh, so, but um, as Roger Ames writes in his uh, brief, uh, preface, preface to this work, um, this work can, Zhuangzi can mean many different things to many different people. He's very uh, inspirational. So why would I like to add even more water to this flute of, uh, uh, unceasing flute of interpretations? Uh, of course, you one, we have already rejected the idea of an absolute text or an absolute meaning. Um, so we can also question the notion of an absolute interpretation. So there is nothing wrong with that, that uh, means many different things to many different people. But the real reason for my adding more water to this flute is because with these interpretations or with the connection of, the, of my interpretations of these two stories, I would like to demonstrate how a new meaning and understanding can be acquired through the method of unifying, unifying or fusing the aesthetic realms, jingjes, that can be experienced in these two separated anecdotes. We without relying on their strictly, strictly uh, conceptual uh, connotations. So if we try to connect and understand both stories in this way, namely considering the broader essential context of which they are both part, we can easily see that they are both dealing with human relations or relations between living beings in general. So many scholars uh, believe that the fundamental source of both stories would probably be linked to the question of the nature of intersubjectivity. The common ground of both debates is namely connected to this problem. It shows us it is about uh, relationships between people or uh, living beings in general. So, it shows us to speak with Ram Adar, uh, Ram Adar Mal that in our attempt to understand uh, one another, we meet to differ and we differ to meet. So um, the first essay emphasizes differences between different beings. If one desires the well-being of everything that exists, one must, according to Zhuang, it's a first get used to the fact and accept the fact that we are all different and respect this diversity. We have to respect that other people, other living beings are different from us. Only on the basis of knowing this fact, namely the fact that we all live in different worlds, can one create close mutual contacts. If we accept this fact, if we, uh, if we respect each other, then we can create uh, genuine uh, contacts. This <laughs> implicitly and latently proposed uh, fusion of jingjes could apply to context and relations between birds and people, as well as those between sinologists and the Chinese, between readers uh, and authors, between people and fish, and so on. So um, the creation of such contacts, as I have already uh, mentioned, um, and communication proves again that we all live in a single unified world. So it is first important to see that we are all separated, that each of us lives in a separate world. All worlds, the worlds in which we live are different. 
But then on this basis, we can create close, close mutual contacts. And this fact, these contacts and this communication proves again that we live in a single world, in a unified world. So um, how did this happen with Zhuangzi, for instance? The second essay shows the Zhuangzi's comprehension of the joyfulness of fishes resulted from the entire context, the entire situation in which the fishes, the fish were observed. Zhuangzi was joyfully strolling in friendly nature, accompanied by his best friend. And he enjoyed the whole situation of which the fish were a part. Hence, his joyfulness could not be separated from the fish and vice versa. It was precisely this very unification of joy or of the, the, the fusion of this joyful jingjias, of these joyful aesthetic realms, which made his innate, complete and comprehensive understanding of fish possible. So the fusion of aesthetic realms experienced in both stories show us very clearly that ultimately it is human individual subjectivity which determines what should be regarded as genuine relationship. In this sense, it can offer us a new and more complex image of intersubjectivity. This kind of fusion is not to be mixed um, with a melting together of two different entities. The story of the seabird shows that what makes any aesthetic fusion possible is precisely the experience of difference and separation. The happy fish from the second essay show through the very fact of their happiness that these differences and separations are instrumental of any genuine and vital and creative unity, precisely because of fusion of aesthetic realms, is always conditioned by diversity. So intersubjective understanding is not conditioned by any criteria of objectivity uh, with agreed upon uh, names. Um, but rather by the thing itself, namely by understanding and experiencing aesthetic realms in which the subjects are embedded. The apparent objectivity and independence of the human rational mind has repeatedly been proven um, as a false illusory chimera, which only leads to self, leads to self deception. The dynamics of being limited to the intimate world of an individual on the one side and the muddled continuous merging of all individual worlds into a single one on the other permits our existence and positions us in what we call time and space. The moment of here and now. And finally, the fusion of individual aesthetic realms is precisely the starting point for constructing a tiny bridge of understanding connecting Zhuangzi and his reader, Chinese and Western philosophy, you and me. So with this connection, I would like to thank you for your patient listening and to complete, conclude my um, lecture. So uh, the floor is yours for any questions. Thank you very much.